scripture reading this morning. Let's turn to the book of Acts, chapter 8, verse 26. Every believer should submit himself to water baptism in obedience to our Lord's command. And the baptism ought to be scriptural. If it's not scriptural, it's not acceptable to the Lord. But I want to point out some things this morning from this scripture about a scriptural baptism. For example, the administrator of the baptism has to be a saved individual, he has to be a member of the church, and he has to know what the Word of God has to teach. Now, there are many kinds of baptisms. There's water baptisms and all kinds of other baptisms, but only one of them is scriptural, and we take the scriptures from the Bible, so we have a scriptural baptism. Now, would you consider letting a Mormon baptize you? No, you would not. Would you let a Jehovah Witness baptize you? No, you would not. Well, why not? Because they don't have the authority to do that. They're not saved people. They don't have authority in their church to baptize anyone. The Lord never gave their churches any authority to baptize anyone because they don't even know Christ and they don't even know the gospel. So this morning I want to start with the question of authority. <clears throat> Who has the authority to baptize? You remember that Jesus came down to the water of Jordan where John the Baptist was baptizing and he asked for baptism. Now he had never committed any sins. He hadn't done anything wrong. Why would he need baptism? Well, baptism doesn't take away sin anyway. But he said it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And uh, I want you to baptize me. And John the Baptist said, I'm not worthy to baptize you. You're the Lord. And I, I'm just uh, a servant of the Lord. And the Lord told him, Yes, you have to baptize me. It was very necessary. Now, Jesus has walked 65 miles to be baptized by John the Baptist. Why did he do that? There were people in Jerusalem and Nazareth that could have baptized him. He could have been baptized by a lot of different people, apostles and so on. But he didn't. He went to John the Baptist. And that's what he had to do in order for his baptism to be pleasing to the Father. That would make it a scriptural baptism, although of a little different reason for ours. And so, we read in Luke chapter 20, it came to pass on one of those days as he taught the people in the temple and preached the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes came upon him with the elders and spake unto him. Now, John the Baptist is baptizing in the Jordan River and the scribes and the elders, that is the Jewish religion, they came to him saying, tell us by what authority does thou these things. Jesus, where did you get your authority to be baptizing people? Or who is he that gave thee this authority? We want to know. How, how do you do this? Where do you get authority for it? And he answered and said unto them, I will also ask you one thing and answer me. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or of men? 
That's one of the other. And they reasoned with themselves, saying, if we shall say from heaven, he will say, why then believe ye him not? Mm. Why didn't you believe him if his baptism was from heaven? That is, if it had heaven's authority. Why didn't you believe him? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, if we shall say from heaven, if we admit that, he will say, why then believe ye him not? But, and if we say, of men, just of men, all the people will stone us, for they are persuaded that John was a prophet. And they answered that they could not tell whence it was. We don't know where it came from. They didn't dare give an answer. So they said, we don't know. And Jesus said unto them, neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. Here he let them know that he had the authority himself to do the things that he was doing and the things that he was preaching and so on. The question of authority in baptism has troubled the church down through the ages because of so many false ideas about it. If we just go to the scriptures, we get the right baptism. For instance, in Luke chapter 7 and verse 28, we learn that the Pharisees had rejected John's baptism. For I say unto you, those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. How did they justify God? By submitting to John's baptism. The Pharisees would not do that. They would not be baptized by John the Baptist. A lot of people today, just like those Pharisees, they will not be baptized by John's baptism. Right. They don't want John's baptism. Right. They're satisfied with some sprinkling or something that they have. But you could not be an apostle of our Lord Jesus Christ without John's baptism. Right. Couldn't do it. Let me read you the scriptures. And they, they, you remember now that Judas had gone out and hung himself and the apostles had to appoint another apostle. There had to be 12 apostles and that left them only 11. And so they're, they're going to have to find somebody to take Judas's place. And we read in, they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether at least two thou hast chosen. Now they had selected two men that he may take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell that, they, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots and the lot fell upon Matthias and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So who became the twelfth apostle? Matthias. The Lord indicated that by, by law. He was numbered. Wherefore, of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John, that's where it all started, under the same day that he was taken up from us, must, what must, that's an important word, must one, be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. Now, in order to select 
Matthias or anyone else, the person they selected had to have witnessed the resurrection of Christ. That is, they had to have known the resurrection of Christ. They had to have been with Christ from the very beginning. That was the qualification to take the place of Judas. And so we read in verse 21, Wherefore of these men which is accompanied with us, notice he had to be part of that group, all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John, under the same day he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. If he wasn't part of the original group, he could not qualify to become an apostle. Verse 23, And they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And then they cast lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and so they knew that the Lord had chosen Matthias. Now in Ephesians, chapter 2 and verse 20, we read that John the Baptist baptized Christ and all the twelve apostles. All the twelve apostles had John's baptism. And Christ's church is built on those apostles. When Jesus started his church, he started it with the twelve apostles. And those twelve apostles were the beginning of his church. And they were his apostles. And Jesus is the chief cornerstone of that church. Now what church was it that he started? We hold that it was a Baptist church because of these scriptures. Just going on here. Since the material of the church Jesus built was made ready by a Baptist preacher. Every one of the first members of the Baptist church or of any church was baptized by John the Baptist. The very first church members in the world that ever existed had John's baptism. <clears throat> Since the material for the church that Jesus built was made ready by a Baptist preacher, and it was Baptist material, the church organized out of it was a Baptist church. The church that Jesus called my church was therefore a Baptist church. They didn't call it a Baptist church right then. In fact, they couldn't because they'd get their heads cut off. But it was a Baptist in doctrine, in beginning, in origin. It was a Baptist church. And it is the, and the Baptist churches are the only churches that can trace their origin back to John the Baptist. There's no other church can do that. Presbyterians can't do it. The Methodists can't do it. Church of England can't do it. Only the Baptists have the evidence of their existence all the way back to John the Baptist. So we conclude from that that logic would tell you that the church today still existing as a Baptist church is the right church. You're in the right church this morning. You're sitting in the right church, according to these scriptures. And then I read that Baptist churches are correct in their doctrine, they're correct in their practices, they're correct in their origin. By the way, you may not know this, but the word Baptist I've had people tell me, well, Lord, Baptist, Baptist isn't in the Bible. Well, my dear friend, you've never read the Bible. Because if you open your New Testament, you'll find the word Baptist 14 times. It's right there, 14 times. It doesn't say Baptist church 14 times, but it was a Baptist church that was spoken of in these scriptures. So, what we say and what we believe and what these scriptures tell us, 
that the Baptist churches are the Lord's churches, and therefore they alone were given the commission to baptize. So that's the authority of the Lord's church. And we believe that. And sometimes people come to us from other churches, Presbyterians, Methodists, and so on, and they say, well, I like your church. I think I'd like to join. And I say, well, that's fine. We'll arrange to baptize you next Sunday. Oh, oh no, I've already been baptized, I say. I said, well, who baptized you? Oh, Presbyterian Church. I said, how did he baptize you? Oh, he said, he sprinkled a few drops of water on my head. And he called it baptism. That's not baptism. Baptism is by immersion. Right. It's a burial. It symbolizes your death to sin and alive in Christ. That's immersion. In fact, the, the word means to dip in the Greek, or to plunge, or to submerge. It has four or five meanings, and every one of them is a, a meaning that is complete immersion. The word sprinkling is only found two times in the Bible, and in both times it it's refers to the sprinkling of the blood of the cross. Mm. It has nothing to do whatsoever with water. So we baptize in water according to the authority that the Lord has given this church. I have no authority to baptize anyone, but I have authority from this church to baptize in the name of the Lord because I'm the pastor of this church. So I'm authorized to baptize. And only an ordained minister of the Lord's church actually should do the baptizing. Now we want to move over a little bit. I want to give you a couple of things that's evident in history books. Not only did Jesus walk 60 miles to be baptized by John the Baptist, because that was God's plan, that was God's order, and he did everything in order. Walk 60 miles to John the Baptist, and John the Baptist baptized the Lord Jesus Christ. That ought to make it a pretty good baptism, wouldn't you say, if, if the Lord submitted to it, and he did. A few examples. When there were no Baptist churches in Germany, Mr. John G. Compton became a Baptist by reading the New Testament. And he started on a trip to England to find a Baptist preacher to baptize him. He knew that it had to be a Baptist baptism, and he wanted Baptist baptism, and he headed out on his way to find a Baptist preacher in England that would baptize him. Then Mr. Johanna, the Persian, converted under a Presbyterian missionary, read the New Testament, and came from Persia to New York to get Baptist baptism. He wanted Baptist baptism. In the island of Cuba, Mr. Diaz, became a Baptist from reading the New Testament. That is why in the state of Brazil, men converted under a Presbyterian missionary and made Baptists by reading the New Testament sent for a Baptist preacher in Pernambuco to come up and baptize them. Now, the Bible says that Jesus came to be baptized by John, Matthew 3.13, and that's why Baptists go to the water instead of bringing water to the candidate. Mm. The Bible says Jesus was baptized in Jordan, 1 Mark 1 and 9. That's why Baptists baptize in water instead of putting water on the candidate. Baptists reject all other baptisms except Baptist baptism because there is no other kind in the Bible. 
You can study the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and you won't find any other kind of baptism except the one that we're talking about here this morning. Jesus and the 12 apostles all had Baptist baptism. They had to have it to be apostles. To reject Baptist baptism is to follow the Pharisees instead of Jesus. And Luke 7.30 says they rejected the counsel of God against themselves, not being baptized of John. Right there you have it in Luke 7.30. They rejected the counsel of God how? By not being baptized of John. Mm -hmm. If you reject the baptism of John, you reject the counsel of God. That's what the scripture says. You can look it up. It's the seventh chapter of Luke and verse 30. All those who reject Baptist baptism are following the example of the Pharisees instead of following the example of the persons and the scriptures. And then we read again. When they got ready to replace Judas, it says in Acts chapter 1 and verse 21, Wherefore, of these men which had company with us all the time that Jesus went in and out among us. Notice, they had to choose a man who had accompanied the other apostles all the time as they traveled with Jesus. Then verse 22 says, beginning from the baptism of John under the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. They could not replace Judas unless they had somebody who had been with them from the beginning of the baptism of John. Now those are things that are in the Bible. I didn't make those things up. I'm reading them to you from the Bible. The second thing is, immersion is the only correct baptism. And it has to be, as far as Baptists are concerned, uh, a baptism by a Baptist church. The authority for the scripture is scripture itself. Who are baptized? Only those who profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we will baptize you. That's the only requirement. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Then we will baptize you. But now I want to look at some things. How this individual was saved. In verse 28, if you want to follow in the scriptures, I'm just going to use the scriptures, and that's all. Verse 28, he learned he had been to Jerusalem to worship, but he had learned nothing. That's what happens a lot of times. People go to a church to learn about God, and they don't learn anything. They're not taught anything. He learned nothing at Jerusalem. We read in verse 28. Was we, Acts 2, uh, Acts 8 and verse 28. Was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah, that's who this is, the prophet. Now he's getting to the place where he's going to get some information. He was reading the Bible. He was reading the prophecies of Isaiah chapter 53. Then secondly, in verse 29, the Holy Spirit was leading Philip to this man. Verse 29, then the Spirit said unto Philip, Philip was a church member, go near and join thyself to this chariot. The Holy Spirit is the one who comes to the lost sinner with the information of the gospel. Thirdly, in verse 30, the word of God was used. 
how do you get a good, genuine convert to baptize? First, you have to give that person the word of God. Verse 30. And Philip ran to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? Do you know what the Bible teaches? Do you understand what it says? Is it plain to you that it's by the cross that we're saved? Philip heard him reading the Word of God from Isaiah the prophet. And if you want to be saved, one of the greatest passages is found in Isaiah chapter 53. Then in verse 31, he had a desire to know. He was a follower of Judaism. He had gone to Jerusalem that particular Sabbath to worship. But he didn't know anything and he thought he could get some information if he would go to Jerusalem. So he came to Jerusalem. He didn't learn anything, but he got a Bible. And that's all he needed. In verse 30, he had the Word of God employed to him. In verse 31, he had a desire to know. The Lord does not save people if they don't want to be saved. Mm. If you want to go to hell, He'll let you go. Right. If you refuse to trust Him, He will let you go. Right. But He will draw you and He will work on you and He will do everything in His divine power to open your mind and help you understand that you need Jesus. Only Jesus can take away your sins and only His blood shed on the cross of Calvary can take your sins away. And so, He had a desire to know. That's why He made the trip to Jerusalem. He wanted to know. And I remember the night I was saved, when I heard the Gospel preach, I wanted to know about it. I didn't want it. Verse 31. And he said, how can I? How can I understand what I'm reading unless some man should guide me? That's what I'm doing this morning. If there's anybody here that's never been saved, I'm trying to guide you just like Philip guided this man to the truth. And he said, how can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. He said, come on up here and sit with me and explain this to me. Then in verse 32, Christ is preached by Philip as the crucified one. He did not preach to this poor lost man social betterment. Mm -hmm. He did not preach communism. He did not preach giving all your money and you'll be saved. He did not preach do all kinds of good works and you'll be saved. Right. He did not preach that you have to keep the law to be saved because nobody was ever saved by keeping the law. So what was he preached? He was preached to Christ. He heard Christ preach. There in Isaiah 53, how he was wounded for our transgressions, how he was bruised for our iniquities, how the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And here, all of this was accounted from Isaiah 53 to this poor man. This man got the gospel. That's what he got. He got the gospel. Isaiah 53 is the gospel. The Jews today don't believe it, but they will someday when they're converted. Isaiah is the gospel. He was led, and here's what he read, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter. That's the cross. Like a lamb, dumb before his shearer, so open he not his mouth. In other words, Jesus never protested. He never argued against it. He never tried to fight back. He submitted himself to the cross. 
willingly because he came for that very purpose. Then what did he read? Verse 33. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. He laid down his life on the cross of Calvary. Then who is this man? By this time, he's very curious. He's been given the gospel. He's been given lots of things that he didn't know. And verse 34, he wants an identity. I want to know who this man is. You've been telling me all about this man. How he was wounded for our transgression. You've been telling me about this man. How he died. I want to know who this man is. Verse 34, And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or some other man? Now, I don't know who you're talking about. You're talking about this man who suffered so, but I don't know who he is. And I, I'm aghast at some sermons that I hear when they don't even mention the name of Jesus in the sermon. They don't tell the sinner who it is that can save him. What did he read in Isaiah 53, 7? His life is taken from the earth. That's his death on the cross. Then who is this man? Verse 34. His name is Jesus. He is the Christ of God. Then in verse 35, preaching Jesus takes preaching. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. I preach to people. Some preachers today say what you ought to do is just talk in a conversational tone. Well, Philip preached Jesus to him. I preached the gospel. Then in verse 36, Philip had instructed him about baptism. And as they went on their way, they came to a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What does hinder me to be baptized? What stands in my way? What requirement must I meet? In verse 37, faith is displayed in confession. Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord called away Philip. 